Hello, this is Ken Fryer, Chief Investment Officer of Atlas Capital Advisors, joining you from beautiful San Francisco, California. This is a presentation about ideas to avoid getting clobbered in the next bear market for public equities. There are all kinds of potential problems for the global economy. Uh, we've just had Britain plan to exit the European Union. There's an excess of debt in China. Uh, central banks have been lowering rates um, to try to stimulate growth, and now rates in many places around the world are negative. Are we about to have a recession? Unfortunately, we don't know. No one really knows or is very good at predicting recessions. Uh, however, we do have some ideas that you may find interesting. This slide um, has, has my handsome picture and, and my two partners who run Atlas Capital in San Francisco. And here's a way of potentially looking at the stock market and avoiding trouble potentially uh, when the next downturn occurs. Now recessions can be quite detrimental to the portfolio values of equity holders. This is a chart showing the total return of the S&P 500 over a little bit more than 20 years. And in that period, we had two major drawdowns uh, associated with recessions. There was the, the period after 2000 in the dot-com bust when the S&P owners lost 44% of their equity value. Stock values climbed back up after that uh, reaching a peak in 2007, and then investors lost more than half their money in the global financial crisis. Is it, is it a, a natural consequence of being an equity investor that from time to time you experience losses of this nature, or might it be possible to do a bit better? If you think that a recession is going to lead to another big loss, well, then you have a motivation to try to predict a recession. But what is a good method to predict a recession? What many of us try to do is to listen to elite economists or other wise prognosticators about the future of the economy. The challenge is that although the people in the economics professions are very highly educated, very intelligent people, they don't really have the mechanisms to accurately predict recessions. In the last 50 years, there have been seven recessions in the United States. And the number of times that the consensus of economic forecasters thought there was going to be a recession is exactly zero. You can, you can expand that observation outside the U.S. In, in just the last 15 years, there were 200 instances where a particular country went from having positive economic growth to negative economic growth. And the number of instances where economists predicted that would happen also zero. So you want to know if there's a recession, but it may be that economists aren't very helpful. Another possibility is to look at price action. And you might have something to work with there. These same seven recessions in the last 50 years have been accompanied by a 15% fall in the S&P 500 within a year when the recession started. And in most of these cases, the stock market action happened before the statistical agencies of the U.S. realized that a recession was underway. There were five other times in the last 50 years where the S&P 500 fell 15% and no recession ensued. So an economist made a quip, something like, like, the stock market has predicted 12 of the last seven recessions. Uh, so it sounds it's amusing, like it's a joke, like why would, why would people pay attention to the stock market as a forecaster? But if you compare these two ways of forecasting, it might be that the stock market has some information that's worth paying attention to. This is a chart about, you know, a very simple momentum-based rule for avoiding losses. What if you followed a very simple rule where you're going to own your position in the S&P 500 if the prior year return is positive. 
And if it's not positive, you're going to own treasury bills and wait for um, a recovery before you go back in. In, in this period, this about 20 year period, um, you would have been in the market most of the time, but you would, your drawdown in the dot-com bust would have been 13% instead of 44%. And your drawdown in the global financial crisis would have been just 6% when those who stayed the course in stocks would have lost 51%. Now, there's no guarantee that investing like this will, will generate these kinds of, of excess returns, but it, it indicates how powerful it can be if it's possible to avoid losses in recessions and how in this 20-year period, if you had done so, with a very simple rule, then you could have ended up with almost twice as much money at the end of the period as if you'd stayed the course in stocks the whole time. So it's not just, it's not just, but well, here's another slide about momentum. Um, in essence, if you look at the Standard & Poor's 500 performance since 1960, and just look at what happens next when the prior year return has been positive versus what happens next if the prior year return has been negative. If it's been positive, the next three return on average was 2.9%. If the prior year return was negative, on average, the next three month return was 1.8%. On average, the S&P goes up, um, but it goes up more if the prior year is positive than if it's been negative. So there's a potential that difference of 1.1% per quarter is potentially advantageous. It's another indication that looking at price action might tell you something that's useful in making portfolio decisions. Momentum is not the only thing that matters, of course. Valuation matters uh, also quite a bit. What this chart shows is the Schiller Cape yield. Now the Schiller cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio is the current price of the S&P 500 index divided by the inflation adjusted average annual earnings for the prior 10 years. Right now, the Schiller Cape is a bit more than 25, and that means the yield, the reciprocal of the Schiller Cape is a bit less than 4%. You see that little oval that says now. So historically, if the Schiller Cape is in the range of current values, the next seven-year return has been about about 5% per year, so less than less than historical. And, and you can tell from this chart that there's a pattern that slopes up and to the right. The better the Cape yield, the lower the Schiller Cape, the higher the future return tends to be. So what if we combine both momentum ideas and value ideas in making equity market decisions? For holders in, of equities, they really have three main questions that they have. And I've been the chief investment officer of some very large and sophisticated plans and have these same sets of questions. One, is a good time to own equities? Two, if I own equities, how do I want to allocate my equities across markets? How much should be in the US versus Europe versus Asia versus emerging markets? If my equity holdings include non-US positions, then what should I do about the currency risk that comes with those positions? So we have a, an idea about how to address all these questions in one coherent strategy. First of all, we, we strongly believe that investing globally makes sense, particularly uh, in today's market environment. Secondly, one can create alpha from beta management. Now, what those terms mean is that they, a way to succeed as a global equity investor is through the choices of betas, which we, by which we mean the choices of particular equity markets to own and to not own. The most important part of own versus not own is the not own part. You can divide up the global stock market into good neighborhoods and bad neighborhoods. And avoiding the bad neighborhoods, which are bad on a combined momentum and value basis is a potential way to improve your results as an equity holder. What, what we do uh, at Atlas with our strategies is we divide global stocks up into 48 markets. 
the U.S. is divided into 12 markets, 10 S&P sectors plus small cap and mid cap. Then there's 36 other markets that we evaluate. So every country from Japan, UK, France, Germany, all the countries, emerging market and, and developed market alike, you can judge every market on momentum and judge every market on value. And a useful way to allocate is to eliminate the markets that have negative momentum and for the markets that are left to weight them based on value, to weight toward the ones that have the higher Schiller K yields and away from the ones that have lower Schiller K yields. Once you make those market decisions, you will know what your currency exposure is and you can do a, a, a separate decision as to whether to have a currency overlay to manage the exchange rate risk. If one were to invest in that way, one would, one would shift their equity allocations dynamically as market conditions change. This chart, this chart shows the composition of an equity market portfolio managed in that way since December of 2000. The purple part of the chart is the weight that would go to the U.S. and Canada. The orange part is Europe. The gray part is emerging markets. The yellow part, sorry, the gray part is Asia, excuse me. The yellow part is emerging markets. And from time to time when there's a, a solid blue allocation, those are situations when there were so few favorable markets, so few good neighborhoods that it, it made sense to get out of the way and own some cash. So this, you can see from this chart that in the period from say 2003 to 2008, when non-U.S. stocks were beating U.S. stocks, that the, the non-U.S. stock weight would be bigger and that it would have been more weighted toward the U.S. in recent years when the U.S. has been the dominant market. Based on our assessment, and this is current as of late June, these are the markets that we see as being good neighborhoods and bad neighborhoods and sort of middle neighborhoods. So if, if the name of the market is in black text, then, then those are good neighborhoods in our view. They look appealing on a value and momentum basis. If the name is red, then we don't see them as good neighborhoods. And at, at the moment, and, and for several months now, we're very um, light in Europe. You can see currently we don't own any Europe uh, positions. That, that has served us well, given the um, market reaction to the Brexit vote. So this is, this is um, our current reading of markets. So to summarize what I've covered, that stock market performance can be a leading indicator of economic weakness. It's worth paying attention to price action when one assesses the future of a global economy. Stock markets are particularly dangerous to own when they're falling and especially if valuation indicators are unappealing as they are in the U.S. at present. So there's potential merit to dividing global stocks into many markets and then assess each of those markets individually, drop out of the bad neighborhoods and adjust to good neighborhoods based on value and be willing to own cash if there are insufficient good neighborhoods in the market. So thank you for listening. If you have any any questions or would like to inquire further, then this slide has our contact information. Thanks again for your time and attention.